The first thing I'd like to do, uh, besides welcome you all, welcome you all to the uh, Hazmat Operations uh, course update, Train the Trainer. Um, if you could all uh, mute your phones uh, so we don't have disruptions, background conversations, uh, and other miscellaneous noises, I'd appreciate it. Um, if we get too much, I'll have to switch back and then I'll have to mute everyone. But uh, as we go through this presentation, I would, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute and ask your question. I'd be, uh, be glad to uh, stop and uh, answer any questions that you may have. So uh, once again, welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Pete Silva, the Education Director here for uh, another day and a half. So uh, uh, this will be uh, my second to the last train the trainer. Tomorrow I do Fire Officer 2, and that will be the last duty that I have in my position. Uh, if you're not aware, I am moving on to uh, uh, an instructor's position at Madison College. Uh, as uh, after the first of the year, and I'll be uh, leaving my position here. So, uh, having said that, let's move on with this information. The first thing I want to talk about is why we did this update here. Uh, many of you have been around uh, long enough to know that our Hazmat Ops course used to be a 24-hour course. And uh, six years ago, when I first came into this position, I, uh, I was uh, summoned around the state to uh, several different uh, listening sessions that was put on by the uh, state chiefs organization and uh, listening to um, uh, firefighters and fire chiefs from around the state, uh, primarily volunteer combination departments, and uh, listening to the, the, the problems that uh, uh, they have with uh, recruitment and retention uh, of volunteers, and uh, a lot of people like to blame training requirements for uh, some of that. And, Training requirements, obviously, uh, um, you know, we, we do have uh, our training requirements not only in fire but also in EMS. So the combination of the two obviously does put a burden on any volunteers that come in. So as a result of these listening sessions, we wanted to do something to try to help alleviate that aspect, uh, the training requirements. And we, uh, we discovered that California, the state of California, has been doing a 16-hour hazmat ops course for uh, several years and it had been successful. So when we found that uh, we could do it in 16 hours, we made the decision to reduce the amount of hours from 24 to 16 and use the California model. Uh, we did take the uh, curriculum that they used in California to, uh, uh, that was the basis of uh, the current course that we are using. Uh, but the unfortunate part about it was that it was not actually directly out of uh, any particular publisher uh, or any particular textbook. So the information was not directly out of uh, IFSTA Essentials or it was not out of the Jones and Bartman Fundamentals of uh, Firefighter Skills. But, however, the course was based on NFPA 472, which uh, listed the competencies for all the hazardous materials, uh, operations, awareness, technician, that type of thing. So. The, the competencies were there. Uh, the competencies, the, the course that we taught, everything was in there. Um, but admittedly now, you know, after looking at it here, it was difficult for instructors and for students to, um, um, to try to uh, look at the textbook and see exactly where they were because it didn't match up. So we recognized that that was an issue. We tried to explain to instructors that uh, you really need to get into the competencies. And actually, if you teach students to the competencies, you don't even need a textbook. Uh, you would be able to pass our exams, our practical exam, and uh, uh, you know basically understand the skills by going by the competencies. But that's uh, um, that's difficult uh, as well. So following the scores, the uh, the written scores, because there was no uh, uh, validate, or I'm sorry, the, the, the written exams were validated to both of the textbooks, which means that um, the t test questions that we had on our written exam did come straight out of the textbooks, uh, but because there was no uh, kind of flow to it, uh, made it difficult. So we did see an increase of uh, failure rates for our HAZMAT written uh, exams, our scores. Uh, surprisingly, retests, they seemed to always pass. So I think it's a combination of not only, uh, I'm not going to blame it completely out of uh, not being straight out of the textbooks, but I'm also going to kind of blame it on the students not actually studying either. So uh, it's amazing how a person can have a score of 40s or 50s on their first exam and come into their retest and have scores of 80s. And so, um, but at any rate, 
what we did was we made the decision to change the curriculum up again so it matched directly out of both the ISTA and the Essentials uh, book. Those are the textbooks that are being used for Firefighter One, and both those textbooks have all the materials on hazardous materials operations in those textbooks. So what we have done is uh, we've uh, I, I gathered up um, uh, a couple of my uh, a few of my uh, go-to uh, uh, curriculum developers, and we sat down to revamp this course so that it does come directly out of the IFSTA Essentials or out of the Jones and Bartlett uh, textbooks. So hopefully uh, in both instructors and students will, uh, will be pleased with this update. I appreciate uh, the work that the committee did, and uh, those committee members are uh, uh, T Ted Harris from up in the Western District, uh, uh, Dennis Myers, who also was an instructor up at Western Technical College, and Rick Merrifield from uh, Chippewa Valley, retired Eau Claire fire, uh, uh, fire Chief as well. So uh, I want to thank those committee members for coming in and spending the last few months here uh, with me working on this course and putting it all together. So um, if, it's, uh, if you like the course and uh, it works well for you, uh, you know who to praise. If you don't like it, um, you can blame me. So, and I won't care because I'm gone. Not really, I do care. Anyways, we're moving on. So, a couple of things here that you should know. This course, uh, the new course, the new HAZMAT course goes into effect after the first of the year. So the spring semester that's starting in January, any courses that begin in January will be using this, uh, this new course. It is still 16 hours. Now, I know a lot of you are not happy that uh, it went from the 24 to 16. In fact, uh, you know, a lot of you feel that we can't even teach it properly in 24 hours. We need more time than that. Um, but unfortunately, we did make that decision. Um, and again, it was made with all good intentions but um, I don't think we did ourselves any favor by doing it. So uh, it's, a, it's a, I, don't, I don't want to call it a mistake. It's just that, uh, you know, we tried to do well, but uh, uh, now we're kind of stuck with the 16 hours, especially right now. Uh, if you're not aware, there is a legislative council here in Madison, uh, state senators and uh, legislators that uh, have been talking about the volunteer recruitment and retention issues. So the focus is definitely on there and how they can uh, make some changes or uh, introduce some bills that can help, which will be a good thing if they can do it. Uh, but now is not the time to change this from 16 back to 24 hours. So it will remain at the 16 hours, but uh, we'll, we'll get it done. The, the, um, uh, the course themselves, the lesson plans, the PowerPoints are straight out of the essentials for ISTA and the Jones and Bartlett Fundamentals of Firefighter Skills. So they are the same textbooks that are being used by the students for their Firefighter One uh, uh, course and their exams. So there is no additional textbook that your students will have to buy as long as they're, uh, most of the people that are coming through this course are going through the Firefighter One course. So uh, they'll have the same textbook. Now, we did do separate book uh, packages, so if your, if your district has decided to use ISTA, you need to make sure that you are using the ISTA package because that's where uh, all the lesson plans, the PowerPoints, and all the materials are going to point directly to that textbook. And when you are done, the written exam, final written exam, is going to come straight out of that textbook that you're using. So it's important for you, and I'll show you the website and how to gain access to it. Uh, but uh, may, please make sure that you are using the proper curriculum for the, uh, for the textbook that's being used in your district. The instructor resource page. Hopefully you are all aware of this uh, uh, page on our website. If you are not, I would uh, strongly advise that you uh, get to the website and I will show you exactly how uh, the instructor resource page looks and what, uh, what is all available here. So the link that I just clicked on brings us to uh, this page here, and over here you will see the Instructor Coordinated State Rep resource site. And we've got two links. We have the Instructor Resources link, and then the bottom link is for Coordinators and the State Reps. The, uh, the, uh, the top link is not password protected. Anybody can gain access to it um, and, uh, at any time, so you don't need a password to get into it. If you want to get into the coordinators and the state reps resources, then you would need the password. 
and that is password protected because we have our examination administration handbooks here which basically has all of our practical certification exam uh, uh, handbooks that uh, have some privileged information that's uh, not out for the general public, primarily students, uh, as well as core, as well as instructors uh, also. Uh, we don't want instructors just uh, teaching directly to the test, so uh, we do keep some of that information behind the uh, password protected area. But all instructors are available or uh, have access to the instructor resource page. So if you click on that link, you will see that we have every one of our certification courses listed. So what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to come down and to the new HAZMAT. Now we have the old HAZMAT information is up currently because we still have some courses that are going on right now. We don't want to take that information away from them. So when you want to look at this new course, come on down to the new HAZMAT course, click on the link. And it will bring you to this page here, which has IFSTA and your Jones and Bartlett. So you will see that, uh, uh, again, depending upon which textbook you're using, you're going to have to click on that area. So if I click on the IFSTA uh, link, you're going to have the lessons that come up. You're going to have the HAZMAT operations course schedule, which we'll go through in a bit. Uh, we've got a skills checklist that we'll go through in a bit. And most importantly, here's your implementation guide. And as an instructor, you should have a copy or have access to this implementation guide so, that, so you know exactly what you should be, what you should be uh, uh, working from. This is the document that you'll be working from. It gives you all the information as far as uh, what you need to do, the lesson plans, the breakdown of the course schedules, uh, equipment that's required, um, uh, a lot of other information, so I would ask that you, um, hopefully the uh, coordinator sent this link out to you and you've had a chance to look through this materials. I'm not going to go through all of this stuff here. I just want you to be aware of where it's at and uh, what you should be uh, uh, looking at. Can you hear at. us from Gateway Burlington? Yes. Hello. Did someone from Gateway just ask, ask a question? Go back to my email. Well, no. Nope. Okay. All right, uh, so that is your implementation guide. Uh, that's the website that you should be looking at, and you'll see under each of the lessons, if I click open uh, lesson number one, you'll see that we're going to have a lesson plan, and we're going to have the PowerPoints. So the lesson plan for you, and then the PowerPoints for delivery. And then above, you're going to see a toolbox. If you click on the toolbox, the toolbox is going to hold uh, materials that uh, actually I picked one that doesn't have anything in the toolbox so let's move back we'll go to uh, lesson two uh, the toolbox essentially is additional materials that you may or may not decide to use uh, it's just additional uh, uh, evaluation checklist it's got pictograms uh, GOSHA has a communication guide etc so these are additional uh, um, tools that we feel could be beneficial to you if you have some time to incorporate them or if you just want to look at it yourself uh, for, uh, uh, for your own information. But uh, I'll go back one here. You'll see that we do have some worksheets, uh, worksheets for the students. We've got uh, the lesson plan. We've got the answer keys for you for any of the uh, worksheets that we provided for you as well. So again, I just wanted to show you where the website is, how to gain access to the website. I'm not going to go through all of this detail. You can do that on your own time. Take a look at it all. All right. Let's move back here. This is the only place that you're going to get the materials. We used to, uh, those of you that have been around long enough, uh, remember that we used to send out instructor discs from the, uh, uh, from the publishers. We are not sending those out any longer because you do have access here. This is the stuff we want you to use. Now, all the PowerPoints and stuff that uh, were in that instructor disk from the publisher, that's what we're using. But we have made changes uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the slides. We've added uh, pictures. We've added information that's uh, uh, particular to Wisconsin, uh, some Wisconsin information. So we want you to use the stuff directly off of here. So if you've got a publisher, uh, Jones and Bartlett or uh, IFSTA, and they sent you all the materials to your, to, your, um, uh, to your college or to you personally, 
please don't just use that because you're going to be missing out on the other information that was added to it. The instructor resource uh, page of our website is where you should get your information, and you should check it for updates. We do update some of our stuff. After uh, I'm sure that after we get done with this train the trainer, a lot of you will go through, you'll look through and uh, uh, the information, and you may find some things that you don't agree with, or you may see uh, typographical errors, or you may see something. Uh, we may have a wrong reference to, um, uh, to a UN number or something like that. You can contact us, and uh, we will make changes if we find that there are some changes that need to be made. And, but, uh, and any changes that are made are going to be added to the back page of the implementation guide. So if we do make a change, a major change to the implementation guide or to the course itself, we will uh, notify the coordinators who should then notify the instructors, but we will also document it on the last page of our implementation guide if there is any updates from the last time it was uh, put out. So again, if you teach a course in the spring here, you'll be using this materials. If you don't teach another course until the following year or maybe later in the fall, then I would go back to this resource page and make sure that you have the most up-to-date information. Some things that you should be aware of as an instructor. There are some videos from uh, the U.S. Chemical Safety Board that we have added to, our, uh, to both uh, uh, packages. So this website here is a very good resource for any instructor that's working with ASMAT, uh, all the levels. And they've got quite a few different videos that uh, would definitely add to and enhance your, your courses. So I just want you to be aware of that uh, site. Also, the WISER site, the Wireless Information System for Emergency Responders. You should be aware of this site and what's available there as well because it is referred to in, uh, within the course. So as an instructor, you should go to this site and uh, check it out. They also have some, a, a lot of good information, a lot of good videos that you can uh, use within the course as well. We are having the students dress out in level B suits, but we're only demonstrating level A suits. Now some districts do have uh, some level A suits and they, they like to get their students uh, uh, dressed up in there, but if you look at the, um, the 472 standards, the, uh, an operations level could possibly uh, dress out in level B, but they're not going to be dress dressing out in level A suits, although they will be expected to assist in dressing out a hazmat technician uh, into those level A suits. So that's why uh, we're stressing that, yes, they should dress out in level B, but uh, only demonstrating, and, and especially because of the amount of time that we have, the limited amount of time that we have. The global harmonization system is covered in this course in both of those uh, packages, so uh, be aware of it uh, yourself, uh, all of that information. We have added activity checklists for both IFSTA and JMB, and I'm going to switch out here and show you the activity checklist. That's not it. This is the activity checklist. This is something that I would encourage you to have your students print off and uh, uh, basically have them keep this uh, as they go along. And every time that they do cover one of these information or one of these items here, or and as an instructor, you should also have this printed off so you, you can make sure that you are covering everything that needs to be covered. So as you can see in the left-hand side, it's got the NFPA competency from 472. It also has uh, the lesson that it is being taught in, um, and then the uh, description of the competency itself. And having a check off will just verify that the students have, uh, that you have actually delivered this, um, this, that particular lesson, and the students have uh, had experience in those particular areas too. So we've added that practical activity uh, assignment checklist for your, uh, for your convenience. Uh, I'm sorry. All right. Sorry about that. Um, as you are going through, if you uh, don't feel that the the textbook really covers something uh, enough, then the competencies are what you should be referring to. The NFPA 472 has a listing of all the competencies that's required by a hazmat operations level personnel. 
There's also a copy of all of these competencies at the back of your implementation guide. So all you have to do is just refer to the back of the implementation guide. You can see the competency and exactly what they are trying to get across to the students. So I would uh, encourage you to look through those competencies. And not only for this particular course, but every course that we deliver is based off of the NFPA standards. The other standards all have JPRs. 472 is only competencies. Uh, many of you are aware that um, the NFPA is working on putting together a, uh, a 1072, NFPA 1072, which is not going to replace, but is going to be kind of mimic 472. They're not going to eliminate uh, the NFPA 472 for some reason, uh, but uh, they are turning it into the competencies into job performance requirements. Uh, so that is coming out at the end of this, this year, I believe. But uh, we are going to stick with NFPA 472 until the Firefighter 1 course is updated, and that's not going to be until 2018. So, uh, uh, but you should be aware of the competencies, and uh, they're, they're available for you. There is an expectation that students are practicing these skills just like their Firefighter 1 skills. We expect them, and you as an instructor should pass on, that they are expected to practice these skills at their own stations. 16 hours, as you well know, is not enough time to get everyone uh, competent in every single skill that's required of an operations level personnel. So you need to pass on that they are expected to uh, practice this stuff at the stations uh, to, to become more uh, competent in that area. So let's talk about the IFTA essentials. Let's talk about the course itself. Uh, if, if you are using IFTA, some of the things that are changing, if you look at the IFTA Essentials uh, uh, textbook, there are only two chapters in that textbook that cover HAZMAT. We've got uh, chapters 23 and 24. Now, in order to put this course together, what we wanted to do is we wanted to try to make the courses as similar as possible between Jones and Bartlett and uh, IFTA. Uh, but we found that was a pretty difficult job. So what we had to do is that we had to break up, because there's only two chapters in the IFTA, we had to break them up a little bit and scatter them throughout the lessons. So you will be hopping around as far as, you know, from chapter 23 to 24, then back to 23 to 24, depending upon the lesson that you're teaching and the skills that are there. So just expect that when you are working with the IFTA uh, textbook, you will be doing some hopping around. It's going to be the same thing for Jones and Bartlett as well because we did put together a course schedule, which we will show you uh, in just a minute. And, uh, but uh, so there is uh, some uh, back and forth between the chapters, so just be aware of that. We also have added some content and skill sheets in the essentials uh, that weren't in the essentials, but were in Jones and Bartlett. So if they were in the Jones and Bartlett textbook and we felt that it was important uh, for everyone to know, then we added that content and some skill sheets to the IFSTA. We also did it vice versa. There was some information in IFSTA that wasn't in Jones and Bartlett that we felt was important, so we did the same thing. So you may see something that is similar or may have, have a different uh, uh, template. Uh, it may say JMB or it may say IFSTA, uh, but uh, that is what happened. We've added that content in the skill sheets. We have taken terrorism from both the chapters, uh, 23 and 24, and put it into one lesson. So both chapters 23 and 24 had different uh, information regarding terrorism, and we combined that all into one chapter, into, or I'm saying into one lesson. Technical decontamination was not, uh, there was no skill sheet uh, or objective uh, in the ISTA manual about technical decon. So we have added the objective uh, and some information into the materials that, uh, so that you will be um, having them work on technical decon. Vapor suppression. Foam operations is covered in Chapter 16 of the Essentials. Uh, with, that has nothing to do with hazmat, but because vapor suppression does, in, does involve foam, using foam, uh, we took the information from Chapter 16 and added it to our Lesson 3, and as you can see, um, that is a demonstration only. There is no skill sheet. There is no uh, skill objective. Um, it's a demonstration of how uh, vapor suppression working with foam works. 
Now, for both IFSA and Jones and Bartlett, here's some changes that have been done for both of those textbooks. Multi-gas meters was not in either of the books. Uh, there is uh, some very brief information, but uh, the committee felt that it was very important uh, because every department seems to have multimeter gas or multi-gas meters that we should cover this information. Now, so the information is not actually in the textbooks, but we have added information to the lesson plans and to the, uh, the PowerPoints as well. Now, we are recommending, I know that uh, some of you may have your students bring in their multi-gas meter to, the, uh, uh, to your training so you can use it. And it's a, it, on, on the whole, on the surface, it's a great idea because you can teach them using the, the tools and equipment that they are actually using in their department. However, you know as well as I do that there's going to be someone out there if they send the multi-gas meter with them, with a student here, and it comes back broken, or even if it was broken before they, they sent it out, claiming that it's broken, liability aspects is there. So also another reason we decide that we decide to recommend against using them is because uh, we do want you to demonstrate, you know, uh, doing the bump tests uh, on the gas tests uh, on real gas, and some of the tools that you use there can saturate, oversaturate the uh, the sensors, and now you've uh, just kind of ruined their uh, their meters. So uh, each uh, district should have uh, meters, and I've got a list of equipment lists that I'll show you in just a second. Uh, but uh, we're recommending to have one gas meter for every six students if possible. Obviously financial aspect is uh, 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 the financial status of the, the districts is a concern so they may only have one but uh, so you have to break it down into uh, groups. <clears throat> the JMB skill drill used for IFTA is used uh, and I just confused myself with that sense. I just put this together earlier last week and I'm not sure what I put that down there for. Probably just because we did have uh, we didn't have information in one of the uh, the chapters, so uh, we just uh, added it to the other book. We have added materials for a couple different areas here, so you should be aware of it and how they work. Developing an action plan is big in the uh, both the textbooks, so you need to work on uh, the students developing an action plan when they arrive on scene of an incident. Uh, they, we have added a pesticide label activity. Also an SDS activity, formerly the MSDS, and we've also uh, added an I, uh, incident command system activity as well. So these are here. Now you may be saying to yourself, 16 hours wasn't enough to get it done. Now you're adding all this stuff. We have reconfigured this course. We have reconfigured. We've taken some areas and put less emphasis on areas that we felt uh, didn't need as much emphasis on and added uh, uh, some other areas. So that's what we've done. So. Uh, don't fret. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to get it all done. The Jones and Bartlett textbook, uh, if, you're, if your district is using Jones and Bartlett, some of the changes there. We've added a remote shutoff skill drill, which is not in the textbook. So you will have a skill drill there, but there is information in the lesson plan and the PowerPoints. You're going to be presenting the information that they have about underflow and overflow procedures but they also have a skill drill, but you're not going to be required to use that skill drill. This is an area that uh, they should be aware of, and you should cover it uh, uh, fairly well. But we, because we don't have the resources, obviously you're going to need some sort of a stream, some sort of a uh, flowing water situation, and uh, most of the districts, I would say, venture to guess that all the districts don't really have anything readily available in order to do this. We we, I, I can tell you with certainty that we won't be testing this at our practical exams. We do have a test for it because we have to, but it is one of those areas uh, just like our ground fires in uh, Firefighter 1. We don't have the resources to be able to test them. So uh, they should be aware of it, and, but uh, you're not going to be actually doing it. Quizzes and exams or quizzes and tests. Both textbooks have online resources, and hopefully uh, uh, most of you have access to at least taking a look at resource one from the uh, IFSA uh, publishers, and uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the uh, system for Jones and Bartlett right off the top of my head right now, but both of them have 
uh, additional resources for instructors, including test banks uh, or end of chapter quizzes. So I would uh, advise you to t access those online materials and actually have your students, because each student, when they get the textbook, they have access to the online resources as well. They've got flashcards, they've got games, they've got other, uh, the PowerPoints basically um, that uh, are from the publishers. So there's a lot of additional online resources that are available both to the instructors and to the students themselves. So uh, please uh, access them yourself and encourage your students to access them for their study uh, of the materials as well. But uh, you will need to create your own cha end of chapter quizzes, but like I said, the online resources has those for you, so you can create, um, you know, if you've got a 25 question test bank, you can take 10 or 5 or whatever you want to do and create your own. So I recommend you doing that. A final exam for that class is totally up to the district and the time constraints. So a final exam in the class is going to be up to you, the instructor, or your district, the district coordinator, whether you want to give them a final exam, whether they, that will determine whether they pass or fail. But I would venture to guess that you are going to be able to check the students off as they go through the course, and they, you'll, you'll know whether they pass or fail before that time. So uh, there is no requirement for a final exam within the class itself. That's up, totally up to you or the district. However, the 25 question written exam that's required for uh, moving on to the Firefighter 1 exam is a requirement for if they are moving towards certification for Firefighter 1, every student has to go through that 25 question written exam. And this is not delivered during the course. This is not part of the course. Certification is voluntary. That's why we don't do the certification exams during the course times because you can go through the course and not become certified but that's up to the student. So some of you have had the final exam scheduled on your last day of your 16-hour of your class. You cannot do that. This has to be a separate day or separate hours separated away from the course. So um, please make, make a note of that to make sure that you're not setting that up during the 16-hour uh, course time. The exams themselves are validated to the textbook that you are using. So if you are teaching out of the IFSTA book, you need to make sure your coordinator requests the IFSTA test that comes with it. We have, uh, we have the 25 question uh, exams. Uh, uh, we have two versions, uh, one for IFSTA, one Jones, and Jones and Bartlett. We would hope that you get the correct one, and uh, so everybody has to make sure everybody's working together to make sure you do get the correct one. Although, if you teach to the competencies, everyone should pass, doesn't matter if you get the JMB or the IFSA, because the information is the same. All the competencies are the same. The information that's delivered is pretty much the same. Wording is different between the two different publishers. There's different emphasis between the publishers, but otherwise, you know, if you, if you teach directly to the competencies, you know, they should be able to pass that exam. So, but make sure that you are uh, uh, requesting the, the proper exam from our office. So, I'm going to, what I'm going to do before I ask, uh, open up for questions is I want to show you some of the other documents that we do have available for you. Uh, this is our uh, hazmat operations equipment list. So, the, the district coordinators have all received this list and hopefully uh, you've got everything that's uh, listed on here. So this, this is the equipment that is going to be required in order for you to properly teach the practical skills uh, using the skill drills or the, uh, the exercises from your publisher. So that is available uh, on our instructor resource uh, um, page. Here is this course schedule, and this is, I'm just gonna show you the Jones and Bartlett because uh, the IFSTA is pretty much the same thing. This is the recommendation and the chap uh, the amount of time that you should be spending in here. Now, this, again, this is going to be up to you. You know, if you can get some of these uh, items done in less than the time that, uh, that you have, or if you've got a large class and it's going to take you more, well, then you know you're going to have to make some adjustments. But this does break down the course schedule. There are four lessons. Both IFSTA and Jones and Bartlett have four lessons. The chapters that are covered and the lecture and the content that are covered are listed there. 
the recommended hours that uh, you should spend teaching that particular uh, lesson, and then it also lists the practical skills that are required for that particular lesson. So that, uh, that course schedule, and again, this is the Jones and Bartlett. The if still looks exactly the same, uh, but just obviously the different chapters and uh, uh, information is, uh, is different there. And let's see, the implementation guide I showed you already. So those are the documents that are available to you. And again, I would encourage you after you get off uh, the line here, if you've got some time, uh, go to the instructor resource page if you have not done so already. Look through the materials and uh, um, uh, you know, let us know what you think. Now, I, one thing I forgot to mention is that the practical exam, the practical exam is not changing. As you know, the practical exam for the hazardous materials operations section is within the Firefighter 1 certification practical exam. One of the stations is our hazmat station. Those hazmat stations were, were changed back when we updated that Firefighter 1 course a couple years ago, and we have not made any change whatsoever to that test. We didn't have to. The information that they're receiving is all the same, so there is no reason to change that practical exam. So uh, there's nothing that, uh, that needs to be done as far as the practical is concerned. If they can go to all these practical skill activities, if you can teach them uh, all these practical skill activities, they will be able to successfully pass that particular station at their Firefighter 1 certification exam. All right. So those are the uh, documents that are available. Now I will bring it to, do you have any questions? Don't forget to unmute your phone. Yeah, this is Joe Bartholomew. Yes. How, co how come with, as a firefighter in the United States, our state does not teach them anything about monitoring when they're going into IDLH atmospheres and you're only doing the uh, stuff that cops should have for operations? This class does not meet all those requirements. The competencies doesn't meet all the competencies. And that does not, because if you look at what a firefighter is supposed to do, and when you look at a police officer is supposed to do as hazmat ops, they don't meet it. I taught in Illinois, and I've taught across the country. You are not, you are telling firefighters they are hazmat ops trained. They're given a meter. They go into a burning building to check the the, the atmosphere. They don't meet those requirements. The other thing, if they go to a recon on a hazmat, even at operations level, they are not carrying a monitor they because they don't know even know how to read it and we're not teaching that in the hazmat ops course we're only giving them what a police officer should have as going into a hazmat ops situation and the basic stuff for it or in a command type staff not for a regular firefighter doing their job um rick merrifield or denny are you guys on the line do you guys have any um, um any information that you can share regarding that question at all Ted Harris, any uh, any of the committee members, are you on? Pete, this is Rick. Uh, we were having a conversation here, so I apologize. I did not hear the first part of the question. Um, why aren't we teaching firefighters that are going through hazmat ops anything with monitoring? You went to the 16-hour course, and what you took out was monitoring, and that is one of the major things these guys need to know. Yes, decon is great, but you still need to monitor in decon. You still need to monitor in a regular thing. They have no idea how to use a monitor, and all the firefighters I've talked to up in the North Woods here have no idea how to use their frickin' monitor. It is um, a component of it, and Pete, if you look into um, in in your folders there, we had that uh, meter presentation. We put together a generic meter presentation because some of the instructors are fairly knowledgeable about meters and can go through with their teaching materials, but we did put together a generic meter presentation that is part of the program, and that should be presented to them. So the instructors are going to have to, if they're not knowledgeable about meters, for gas meters, they are going to have to spend some time prepping for it and then use that PowerPoint there. So. That was one of the things we talked about with the 16 hour is the two most important things that hopefully they get out of this is how to use their emergency response guidebook and other resources that are available such as Wiser and how to use gas meters. And so there is that component in there and Pete, I don't know if you can find it in there, but it should be in that folder also. Yeah, there is no practical on how to use the meters. There's not enough time to describe the meters because if you look at it, doesn't talk to you about anything about 
how to understand what an oxygen meter tells you. It doesn't tell you anything about the cross sensitivities of the meters. It doesn't tell you the basic stuff on how what you're getting and how you're reading. You, you give a brief description of what they are, what the rad meter is, what the uh, four gas meter does, basically a little bit about pH paper, but there is no demonstration on it. We do have it on the schedule, and I've just got the IFSA schedule here for lesson four. We've got detection equipment there, and that's when we actually do, we had a practical built into it for, um, for the technical colleges. That's why they had to bring meters with them to the class. Uh, we recommended that they use gas bags there, and what they actually do is they go through and they've got a component where as a crew they go through and they determine in the different gas bags what kind of readings they're getting and then report back to the instructor. So there actually is a practical component for the meters along with the PowerPoint on there on going into greater detail on meters. So it's, it, there's nothing there before and we felt how important it was that fire departments are using meters out there. Uh, a lot of them when I go around and give refresher classes for HAZMAT they have no idea how their meters work. They don't know what the readings are. They don't know when they were last calibrated. So we felt it was important that we did include meters in this, and so we do have it in this component. Well, but to safely do a meter instruction for a firefighter, you're going to need a minimum of four to six hours to actually teach them. And in the practical, and that takes away from a 16-hour course, and there is no way you can do a dress out, you can do a decon thing, and meet all the requirements that you're trying to do with this lecture and do you know because of the time frame of the 16 hours with the 16 hours what we did is we tried to include what we felt was important and meters some instructors are going to be you know well versed on meters and they're going to be able to spend the time and go through it others may not so we have kind of the minimum component in there with that powerpoint and with also doing the hands-on demonstration. Other instructors, if they can, you know, fudge the times a little bit and stuff, they can spend more time on meters, but it was more than what was in there before. Uh, oh, no, I understand that. It's more than what's in there, but it's, it's still, to me, not enough, and I, it's, it's kind of scary putting your name on a signature when you're not teaching them the competencies on how to use a piece of equipment. They can use a shovel and dam diking and diverting, uh, they can use plastic bags filled with water and put it over a manhole cover, but y you can show them that. You can do the, by the time you do the dress out properly and have them do the things that they need to do, that takes away from the time to do the, this type of stuff for the metering. And um, I've, I've, you know, in my, res my abilities as a hazmat responder in 32 years in the fire service and re responding to uh, um, a couple hundred level two hazmats, uh, using level A suits, level B suits, uh, fire gear, metering, um, and I've also calibrated meters and all the stuff uh, and trained how to do all, all sorts on them. But the problem is I don't have the time to teach the students how to use them correctly. Rick, no, I, can, um, uh, I, I appreciate where you're coming from on this, and, uh, and I do, but, you know, the, the fact is, is we've got 16 hours, and so it, it, it's... You know, we, we have to make the decision on where we're going to go with this. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that we could have a conversation. I'm sure there would probably be a countering opinion of uh, somebody on the line that would think that, you know, you don't need as much as you're talking about, but you need something in another area here. So we're, we're, we're trying to balance, you know, uh, basically trying to fulfill the, uh, the requirements from 472 as best as we can within the time period that we have. So that's what we have. No, and I understand. I just... You know, to me, that this it's not. It's, it's, I don't feel that we can call them hazmat ops trained by not giving them more training. That's all. Yeah. Uh, Pete. You know, Pete. Yes. Go ahead. This is Marcy Chubshaw calling. Um, I just want to say that it really is important for the instructors just to stress that they go back and practice on their own. Some of the responsibility has to be placed on the departments to take the information they received and go back and work with their own meters. If you if you talk to the other departments, they have no people with the knowledge, so they don't know how to do it. That's a good time to contact the manufacturer's rep and have them come out and do a demonstration for the department. That, I, I, I've also used that type of information and told them, but that's also another thing that's hard to do with these departments. And so I'm picking up, and it's just scaring the heck out of me that they're not getting proper education. And I also teach for 
dirt seats and on derailments and stuff, and you wouldn't believe how many people that are volunteer departments across this country that only get 16 hours of training don't know what to do with these incidents. Oh, I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> believe me, I'm not surprised at all. And, but, the, you know, it's a, it, and this is a conversation that we can have about every single one of our courses. You know, Firefighter 1 is only 96 hours. We're, we're at the bottom of the totem pole for, for the, those hours. So, so we have the same, that's the, that's the issue that we're dealing with. We're dealing okay. with the amount of uh, money that's available, the amount of time available, that type of thing. So uh, I understand where you're coming from. Um, you know, there's something to, for all instructors to think about as far as the you know, priorities on a fire ground or uh, an operation scene, uh, that type of thing. And, uh, you know, we leave it up to the instructors to try to, uh, you know, to, to do the best they can to get the areas that they think are going to be most pertinent to the area that they're teaching in. Okay. And I, I just had to vent on that. I appreciate that because... But thank you, and I'm going to make it, you know, this will, I like this curriculum better because it does meet it. The other one you had in there, there was a lot of uh, uh, stuff that was missing. So, yes, this is, this is a great idea, what you're doing, um, and um, I appreciate it. Uh, so thank you on that. Um, you're welcome. Thank you, Joe. appreciate it. Okay. Any other questions? I don't know. Pete, this is Everett Mueller. I do have a question. Yes. Uh, question in reference to the React Center, the Wisconsin Emergency Management, and the Wisconsin Technical College System. Yes. Currently, there's a discrepancy between those two. Of course, one is pro board, and I'm not really sure what certification we're giving anymore. Um, but when you look at the certification process through React Center, it's actually a 24 hour course for the Hazmat Ops course, and that's what they're advertising on their website. And then they have the caveat that you're going to have the 50-hour course when it comes to the hazmat tech portion of it, mm -hmm. so that you would actually have to have hazmat ops prior to. So they actually have 84 hours or 80 for their commitment, and we only have 80 hours in our commitment. I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of discrepancies between Wisconsin Emergency Management and the Wisconsin Technical College System. Is there anybody that's going to bring those two together so that we have a coordinated system and a coordinated certification process for this? Well, we may even have um, uh, some representatives from uh, Wisconsin Emergency Management on the, on the line. If they're not on the line right now, they uh, will be listening to this as well, too. You know, is, the REACT Center is primarily geared towards military members. Uh, that's their clientele. Their primary clientele is, uh, is military members. Uh, so... Uh, I understand what you're saying, and you know, possibly uh, my successor here can sit down and uh, maybe uh, coordinate a little bit more closely, but um, so that's something to consider. A little bit more to that. Some of the discussion that's been between the teams and the state of Wisconsin is that they want pro board certification, and they want to hold all the hazmat technicians to that certification level. So I guess that's where the confusion is. If they're going through the Wisconsin Technical College system, to get their certification, are we really needing that, and are, are they going to be able to meet that portion of it when it comes to pro board? Well, if you look at the uh, if you look at the standard, the only person that can actually certify someone is the AHJ, which basically means uh, either the team or fire department uh, fire chief. So uh, we don't provide okay. a certification uh, here. We provide the training, and then the, uh, you know the person, the AHJ, is the authority here having jurisdiction is is the one uh, responsible for telling, saying whether somebody is certified in that area or not. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Pete, hey, John here at Gateway. We lost audio for about five minutes. Uh, we may have missed the part about the 2012 versus the 2016 ERG. Okay. Did you talk about that at all? Did we miss that? Nope, we didn't. Uh, and I and thank you for bringing it up because I did not mention it. We are working out of the 2016 ERG, period. Every district has 40 copies of the 2016 ERG, and that's the one that this uh, course is based off of. Um, I can tell you that our exam administration handbook for Firefighter 1, if somebody should happen to come in with a 2012, we're not going to, uh, you know, if, I, if that's all they have, we're not going to penalize them. We will have the correct answer in our answer key for the 2012, but we do want you to teach out of the 16 ERG. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey Pete, this is Ryan at LTC. We got a couple questions. Okay. 
Uh, first one, uh, we were looking at these slides on the website, and we noticed that uh, someone did update the Jones and Bartlett ones from MSDS to SDS, so uh, whoever did that, thank you. Our question was, did they also update the categories, because we haven't uh, looked at that. Uh, is anybody on the phone that maybe did that project? Updated categories for, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. HS, the, the MSDS categories, just to ensure that they were compliant with GHS. Uh, Rick, are you still there? Do you recall if we had that discussion at all? I am Pete, but I'm still not sure what the question is. The categories for the MSDSs that were referenced in those slides and all the activities from the publisher, those aren't consistent with the GHS, so I'm just curious if those were updated. We noticed that the, the header on the slides did get updated from MSDS to SDS, but we were just curious about the actual categories. When you say the categories, are you talking about the 16 categories that are on each SDS? Yes, and the symbols. And the symbols, yeah. There is, I think, in the, it's, if it's not in the symbol box, it's in the uh, uh, folder also. There is a short uh, global harmonizing system um, document there that does show the updated pictograms that are in there. Um, the S SDS that's being used for the handouts for the students is all the current SDS with the uh, current 16 categories in the order that they should be. Great, thank you. Uh, Pete, second question. We were looking at the uh, implementation guides, and it now states that HAZMAT ops, they must meet the um, certification requirements within two years. Is that correct? It was previously my understanding that the, the HAZMAT ops didn't expire, and the clock started when they actually completed the Part C course. Are you, uh, you confused me there a second. I mean, we, yeah. In the Hazmat Ops Implementation Guide, way at the beginning when it says uh, successful completion, yeah, um, yeah, it says to become IFSEC certified one, the student must complete the following requirements within two years of completing the course. Um, so within two years of completing the Hazmat Ops course, they need to do that? No, 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 no. The, 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 uh, the two years is from the uh, uh, for the Firefighter 1 certification because because the HAZMAT OPS, we don't have an actual certification for HAZMAT OPS. It's just a course, a prerequisite for certification of Firefighter 1. If you have a student that has completed HAZMAT OPS three years ago and they're just going through Firefighter 1 now, that is still good. It, it still complies with the prerequisite. So it's from the end of the Firefighter 1 course, from the end, the last day of the course of Part C, that's when their two, two years starts. But the HAZMAT OPS, as long as they successfully pass that written exam, uh, they're good to go. Could, could we possibly update that sentence, uh, requirements within two years of completing the Firefighter 1 Part C course? Because mm. as I interpret that, it says completing the course. I would assume that that's referring to the header on the page, HAZMAT OPS, 16 hours. Okay, I see what you say. Uh, we'll we'll look at that. Let me let me t uh, have a conversation with someone here, and uh, we'll we'll see if we can get that changed. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Going once. Going twice. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for all your cooperation over these last six years, and uh, appreciate everybody's input. Um, so uh, I wish everyone the best, and I'll see you around. I'm still going to remain as a state rep, so I may see a lot of you out at uh, some of the exams uh, uh, over the next couple of years here. So, But uh, thank you very much. If you've got any other questions here, you can give me a call until about noon tomorrow, and then I'm out of here. So uh, okay. wishing everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and uh, uh, stay safe. Okay. Same to you, and just remember, the Whammer Conference is coming up in February, and they just put the stuff out on it. Okay. Thank you. Yep.